Will you please take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 20? I want to look at verses 19 through 29 this evening. Keep in mind that this took place on the night of the day in which Jesus was resurrected. So John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger in the place of the nails, uh, uh, yeah, my fingers into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Let us pray. Father, we have just read the word. It's your word. It was given to us to teach us, to bring ourselves to you, to bring us to salvation, to give us a greater understanding of yourself and us. And we prayed, Father, that that will take place now as we go through these scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. This hunt, a hymn of the month ends with, or part of the ending is, let there be dancing in the darkness and let our song break the night. I find that to be a truly inspiring message. We will dance differently on the new earth, but for right now, I would like to suggest <clears throat> that we can dance in how it is that we refer to people. Consider a few Bible characters. If I said, what title do we often give to Abraham? You would probably say, Father Abraham, and you're right. What title would we give to David? You'd say, King David, and I'd say, you're right. How do we refer to Thomas? If you need any help, look at the subject line in your bulletin for the message tonight. What do we say about Thomas? Doubting Thomas, you're absolutely right on that as well. You're a good group. You probably don't need to be here tonight. You've got this stuff right down pat. We call Abraham, Father Abraham, because scripture refers to him that way. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse five, God says to him, your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. In Matthew chapter three and verse nine, it says that the Jews refer to Abraham as their father. Therefore we call him Father Abraham. But since Abraham lied to protect himself by referring to his wife as a sister, why don't we call him lying Abraham? It would fit, he did. King David was great as, as Pete's been preaching on here the last few weeks, yet he sinned many times. Why don't we call him David the sinner? He did, but we don't call him that. One reason why we call, why we refer to Thomas as doubting Thomas is in verse 27 that I read, Jesus said to him, not to be unbelieving, but to believe. 
when Jesus said to stop his unbelieving, that didn't necessarily mean that he didn't believe in Jesus. He just questioned whether or not Jesus had actually stood physically with the other disciples on the night in which he was resurrected. Now, in order to call him Doubting Thomas, we have to pull out our new international version of the Bible. We don't use it here, but if you want to call him Doubting Thomas, pull out your NIV. In the NIV, in verse 27, Jesus said to him, Stop doubting and believe. So there it is. We can call him Doubting Thomas. We have to use the NIV, of course, to do that, but that's okay. In verse 24 that I read of our text, Thomas, it says, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The Bible calls him Didymus, but we call him doubting. Make sense? The Bible is silent on why Thomas was not with them when Jesus came the first time, but when his silence ever stopped speculation. I would like to read to you what two people have written about Thomas not being with the disciples on the night Jesus was resurrected. The first one said, Thomas, fed up with such nonsense, grew weary of holding on to a faith that had crumbled. He removed himself from the disciples, telling them he wanted to hear no more about this ridiculous notion of a resurrection. He later wrote that Thomas moved quickly from being a rough talking skeptic to a willing worshiper. Where did this particular author ever read any of that about Thomas? But if you believe he was doubting Thomas, then you just take that a step further and throw in a little bit more description of him. The second author that I looked up says Thomas probably simply broke down under the pressure of the last few days and his way of dealing with the problem was to be alone. Where he ever got, and these were good authors too. I mean, these, these are people, we pay a lot of money for their books, believe me, we do. What those men said about Thomas is really worse than us calling him doubting. Is Thomas the only apostle that uh, did not believe that Jesus appeared in, pos in person? The same event that I just read is in Luke's gospel at well. In Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 36, it records the same appearing of Jesus to the other disciples that I read to you from John. But Luke reported different things. He had a different audience that he was writing to and he told them different things. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 37, this is when Jesus appeared to them on the night of his resurrection. It says they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. Verse 38, Jesus said to them at that, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts. Jesus said the other apostles all had doubts. Why don't we call them all doubters? Why have we selected just one of the apostles that doubted and gave him that uh, nickname? Then after that, Jesus showed them his hands and his feet. Okay, they saw him, he spoke to them, they doubted he was the resurrected Jesus, so he showed them his hands and he showed them his feet. Verse 41, they still couldn't believe. Uh, it said, because of their joy and amazement. So when they still didn't uh, believe, even though they were overjoyed, Jesus offered to eat with them, showing them that he was the real thing. He gave them additional proof beyond the hands and the feet. Then in verse 45, it says that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, go back to John chapter 20 again. In chapter 20 and verse 25, the disciples said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Good. Thomas said, unless he sees what they saw, 
he won't believe. Now, is that all that bad? You have seen his hands and his feet, and you have seen him eat. If I see what you saw, I will believe. Not, not, we're not talking about saving faith. Believe that really Jesus was walking around on earth after his resurrection. All he wanted was the same proof that they had, and we call him Doubting Thomas. It seems as if none of the apostles believed that Jesus had risen from the dead and was on earth until they saw him. So they all doubted, and Thomas also doubted. Now, if the number of words used to describe a situation has any meaning at all, it took more words for Jesus to convince the other apostles that he was there than it took to convince Thomas. Thomas believed with less words than the others, and yet we call him doubting Thomas, and we give the others a pass, even though Jesus said they were doubting it. The Christian community gained a phrase when Thomas understood that Jesus was alive and here on earth. In verse 28, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. This is the first time in the Bible that Jesus was referred to as my Lord and my God. The expression Lord and God had been used, but not in reference to Jesus being an individual person's Lord and God. There's a big difference between talking about the Lord and God and my Lord and God. This concept was introduced here. Now let's take a closer look at Thomas. In John chapter 11 and verse 7, Jesus had learned about the death of Lazarus. He spoke to his disciples about going to Lazarus in Judea. Listen to the reaction of the disciples to Jesus in verse 8. They rejected that saying, the Jews were just seeking to stone you and you're going to go there. That's what the apostles how they responded to Jesus. But verse 16, we have Thomas's response. Thomas, who is called Didymus, just in case we have some other title for him, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. What kind of a person was Thomas when he was speaking there? He preferred death to being separated with, to being without Jesus. I find Thomas to be a very loyal person here, much more loyal than the others. They said, if you go back there, they're probably going to stone you. Thomas said, let's go with him and die with him. Very loyal individual. In John chapter 13, get the setting down in your minds. In John chapter 13, Jesus identified his betrayer. He predicted Peter's disciple, I mean, his, uh, Peter's denial. Then immediately after that, he kept talking to the disciples in John chapter 14, the first four verses. These first four verses come after he uh, uh, predicted his betrayal and his denial. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Of course they would be troubled. Look what he just told them. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. What does that mean? So anyway, if, if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. What does that mean? At this point in time, what does that mean? He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the, where I, the way where I am going. After all of that, only one person spoke up, and that was Thomas. Thomas was very honest. He said, verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? I mean, he, Jesus just loaded a lot onto them. And Thomas says, hey, look, 
We just don't know all of this. It was confusing. The one who was to free them was to be betrayed and denied by his closest followers. Any disciple could or should have asked what Thomas did. Only Thomas spoke up. I'll tell you, someone who has never questioned things has an undeveloped brain. I find Thomas to be very candid and honest here. Very candid and honest. Thomas was not the only person in the Bible that needed to be convinced of something. In 2 Kings chapter 5, in verse 4, Naaman said he would never wash in the river Jordan, but he did. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, Jonah ran away so he would not have to preach in Nineveh, but he did preach in Nineveh. In Luke chapter 22, from verses 55 to verse 62, Simon Peter said he would never deny his Lord, but he did. Thomas said he wanted proof. And remember what he said when he got his proof. Verse 28, my Lord and my God. I find a very humble Thomas here. Thomas had many sides, loyal, candid, honest, doubting, and humble. Yet, we call him Doubting Thomas. Do we know what Thomas was really like? I say study the scriptures that I've given you, the whole context, study everything about Thomas, and then refer to him as you please. But do it from an educated perspective. Now, since we cannot know a biblical character based on one passage, should we form an opinion of anyone based on one incident in their life. All these incidents about Thomas, and we pick the one where he doubted, and we give him that as a label. When you meet him in heaven, apologize to him for every time you've ever called him doubting Thomas. Might as well get off on the right foot with him. Let's assume that we have someone at the kirk that has been nominated for an elder or a deacon, and his name is Charlie. Let's assume that one or more of you went to school with Charlie, and you can remember 37 years ago when nominee Charlie got caught cheating in junior high school. Your attitude towards him now and his nomination in this church is, I would never vote for cheating Charlie to be a deacon or an elder. You've labeled him cheating Charlie 37 years ago. Did he cheat? Yes, he did. So he'll never deserve to be an officer in this church. Now, some of you are smiling. I'm assuming that you can hear yourself saying something similar. Most of you have such good memories. You can remember something negative about just about everybody here and probably more than one negative thing about most people. I'll bet you'll even call Thomas, or you have called him, Doubting Thomas. Why not call him loyal, candid, honest, humble, or Didymus? John called him Didymus three times. And somehow that has just gone right over our heads. Now, in closing, you're going to get to eat a little bit early, but I can make this closing illustration a little bit longer if I have to. One time, my dog Axel asked me for the seeds from a cucumber tomato sandwich that I was eating. I'm a good father. I gave him the seeds from the cucumbers and the tomatoes. He went to our cat, Wolfie, and our hen, Jane, and he asked them to help him plant the seeds. And they both said no. When it came time to pick the cucumbers and the tomatoes, Axel asked Wolfie and Jane again to help him. Again, they said no. But guess where Wolfie and Jane were when it came time to eat the cucumbers and the tomatoes? Right. 
They were at the dinner table with their napkins in place. So Axel came to me and he said, should I share my food with Wolfie and Jane? Now think about it. Should Axel have shared his food with our cat Wolfie and our hen Jane? Think about what he should have done. But you know, like most good stories, there's more to this story. When Axel planted the seeds, Wolfie had just had kittens, and Jane was collecting grain for her mother who had a broken toe. When it came time to harvest the crops, Wolfie had gotten sick from eating some spoiled food a neighbor gave to her, and Jane was out hunting for special leaves in the woods to heal Wolfie. So is it possible that Wolfie and Jane had helped Axel at some other time in the past? Is it possible that they had helped him? It's possible, isn't it? But you know, I can remember one time when Axel was sick, Wolfie caught him a bird to eat and Jane picked the feathers off the bird. I've got great pets. <laughs> so they had helped him at one time in the past, but now let's just suppose that Wolfie and Jane had never helped Axel with anything. Let's assume they ignored Axel because he was a dog and they were birds and cats. Let's assume that they were as mean as sin and they wouldn't even speak decently to him. If Axel refused to let Wolfie and Jane eat the cucumbers and tomatoes, would Axel make a good pastor or a good church officer? Think about it. If he said, no, I will not share with you, would you want that quality in your pastor or in an elder or a deacon within your church? Forget your pet names for people and pick and nominate elders and deacons who would find or help somebody who may or may not deserve it. Helping somebody who deserves it, even the pagans do that. We should be one level, at least one level, above all of that. Now I ask you, how will it be possible to dance in the dark if our words and actions shatter the daylight. The Holy Spirit gives churches officers who are willing to take any of us by the hand and lead us through a difficult spot, even if we're at fault for being in the difficult spot. Even if we are getting what we deserve, Elders and deacons should be there to help us without questions. If you've been caught in a sin, or basically caught in a sin, and you're suffering the results of your actions, a good church officer will be there with you, not sitting in judgment. When you nominate someone to office, that's a quality you can look for. If he refers to Thomas as doubting Thomas, just pass him by. <laughs> See, Thomas was labeled with something he didn't deserve. Now you can look at a verse somewhere in a particular translation and you can extrapolate that and you can label him all the way through life. And that is wrong, especially when he had so many admirable qualities and all of the other apostles, Jesus called, referred to them as having doubts as to what they were seeing. But somehow we picked on one person and we do that quite often. We get this label attached to somebody and we never let it go. Think about these things. Let us pray. Father in heaven, 
We do thank you for this evening, for this very special time. We thank you for the scriptures. Father, help, thank you for opening up these passages to us. And Father, let us be very, very conscious about who it is that we examine to nominate for elder and deacon. But Father, don't let us ever take one action from one person's life and label them somehow a loser for life. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.